It is an honor to stand before you each week and to proclaim a message from God's Word. As we share that message, the great thing about this time and this place is to know that God is worshipped. We lift our voices in praise to Him in song. We bow before Him in prayer. And we open God's Word. God's Word is open. It's read. It's studied in this place. And when we leave, we leave with this challenge to put into practice the things that have been shared here during this time together. We want to live out, to live in obedience to what we read and study in the Word of God. This morning, I'd like to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 2 with just what is some real good news. Let's look at this passage as we begin today. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Man, isn't that great? That's just great news. Uh, Three specific points. First of all, is God wants all people to be saved. God wants all people to be saved. Now, in order to be saved, we need to realize we're lost. I think about if I'm driving to a place I've never been before, uh, directions are a little... uh, Chances are I didn't write them down, okay? And so I don't have that, but I'm going, and I have to come to a knowledge of like, you know what? I'm not going the right way. In fact, I'm lost. That's when I need to turn around and go back and find my way. That's what needs to happen. It is, man, God wants to save us. But we need to know that we need to go to Him. We seek Him because God has the answer. He desires that all people be saved. You know what I think about in in our society today? We're a lot like the story of that frog. If we were to take a frog and to put him in a pot of boiling water, what would happen? Man, the frog would immediately make every effort to get out of that pot. But if we put the frog in some warm, some pleasantly warm water, he might stay there. And we could turn up that heat a little bit at the time. The frog wouldn't recognize anything was wrong until it was too late. That's what I fear is happening in our society today. We are living in a world that is pushing God farther away. That's pushing Christ, prayer, Scripture, and the church farther away. It's like the last thing that society wants to welcome or to even allow to embrace is the idea of a group of people proclaiming God as the Creator, Jesus as the Son and our Savior. And the church is a place where these people come together who have committed themselves to following Him. And man, we're buying along. We're buying along with that. And so we, if we're not careful, we will just ease away. And as we do that a little bit at the time, we won't realize what's happening until it's too late. My prayer today is that we recognize God desires that all people be saved. He wants all people to be saved. We, and I say we as in society, we need to understand where we are before God. Now that's where God desires that we have a knowledge of the truth. Here's what the truth can do. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 and really down to verse 23 will make it clear that we can know what sin is. And we can know that sin separates us from God. In other words, I can spend time in God's Word and I can know I'm lost. That I've got a problem and I need God's solution. I can know that. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 14 tells us that as we mature, that we can come to a knowledge, a discernment between right and wrong. 
And so we can know we're sinners. We can begin to learn right from wrong. It's going to lead us, though, to this relationship with Jesus where we commit ourselves to Him and we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's where John would write in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, that we can know that we are saved. You see, all of that comes from having a knowledge of the truth. By opening God's Word, by reading it, and studying it. So we can have a knowledge of God's Word. But then there's a third message in this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And it's that Jesus gave Himself as a ransom for all people. This word ransom, it's a beautiful word. It really has two ideas, but they both really have the same application for us. That when you think about ransom, you think about paying a debt. Uh, you pay a debt so that something may be gotten back. But we also think about ransom is setting someone free. That's what Jesus did for us. He paid the debt for our sin. He has set us free from the bondage of sin. Again, both points point to the same conclusion. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all people. Our big question of the day is how can all people be made right with God. How can all people be made right with God? You, you, we, we think that's such an easy answer, but I've got to tell you, if history tells us anything, it tells us that we need to make sure that we're in God's Word, because people have tried a lot of things to take care of the greatest problem, which is sin. You see, Jesus is the answer. But people have taken so many wrong paths. I read about one gentleman that lived. He died in 459 A.D. He spent 37 years on top of a pillar in an effort to be right with God. We read about others who have cut themselves, who have laid on beds of nails, who have walked on hot coals, who have hit themselves with whips, who have offered animal sacrifices. They've recited prayers over and over. They've given huge sums of money. They've even attended services regularly. All in an effort to be right with their God or idol, or in some cases, really, with God, with the Lord God Almighty, God the Creator. But the thing we need to understand is that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the answer. And so we've got to make sure we know that. We've got to be prepared for how to share that good news with other people. So our big question remains, how can all people be made right with God? Oh, we've got a great study before us today. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through 26. It's there that Paul writes, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, this is a beautiful passage of good news. How big a deal is this passage? There are different uh, theologians and scholars that have looked at this passage and say, man, this passage, it's the chief point. This, this, because it contains so much, it really is the chief point in the Bible because it talks about sin separating man from God. It talks about how Jesus is the answer. And it talks about that those that are faithful to Christ will live eternal life, that will be right with God. It paves the way to heaven. And it's a central point. Uh, it's a central place. 
It's a central place, some will say, in the book of Romans. Others will say it's a central place in the New Testament. This passage is that packed full of good news. Some will even call it the heart of the Bible. So I, I shared that with us to just let us know that we're, in, we're studying some precious Scripture this morning. Hope that it can encourage us. I hope that it can bless us and help us as we strive to live right with God. But also as we strive to share a message with others who would desire to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Remember, how can all people be made right with God? It starts, but now, apart from the law and the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. But now. Those two words are critical words for us because they let us know and that God has an answer for sin. But now, and there may have been a time that we were separated from God. Sin, we, we know that, we know what it does, whether it's Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, whether it's uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 23, uh, other passages like that that let us know sin separates us from God. But God has an answer for sin. And so he begins this passage with two words, but now, to let us know the answer's coming. Later in verse 21, he'll say that the law and the prophets testify. Now, what's Paul about to talk about? He's talking about Jesus. Jesus has always been plan A. In fact, here's the great thing about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are 450 uh, prophecies that point to Jesus. Now, that's some counts. And, and others, even if we take the most conservative numbers, 300 Old Testament prophecies. Whether we go with 300 or 450, the odds of Jesus fulfilling all of those prophecies, man, it, it's just clear. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is God's plan A. There's no plan B. Jesus is plan A. He always has been. Verses 22 and 23. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we come to this idea of righteousness. Well, what does righteousness mean? If you remember a lesson, it was on Sunday night a few weeks ago from the Beatitudes, we talked about a great definition of righteousness. That righteousness is right standing before God, and it's right living before people. I think the emphasis in this passage is right standing before God. And so with Jesus, it helps us that with Jesus, with Jesus as our Lord and Savior, having that relationship with the Lord, as we follow Jesus, as we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, we will stand right before God. Righteousness, right standing before God. Now, this is beautiful. Uh, verses 24 and 25, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. Three critical words. We have justification, we have redemption, and we have atonement. And so what does it mean to be justified? I, this is a point where we really just need some good definitions to appreciate how good this news is. Is that we are justified before God. Well, what does that mean? It means it's just as if I'd never sinned. When we're baptized into Christ, the blood of Jesus washes our sins away. So when God looks at us, He looks at us through the blood of Jesus, and He sees us, just as if I'd never sinned. That's when He sees us through the blood of Jesus. 
Now, I think it's important for us to recognize that when we talk about justification, we also need to talk about sanctification. It's an entire lesson in itself, but I need us just to be aware of that today. Justification is where our sins are washed away by Jesus, and God looks at us just as if I'd never sinned. But I do still sin. In fact, as I become a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm still young in the faith. I still stumble and fall, and in fact, even now, I stumble and fall. Sanctification is the process, it's the progress that we make. It's why we stay in God's Word, because we learn more every time we read through God's Word. We learn how to better live in the image of Jesus. And sanctification is that process through which we become more like Jesus every day. I'd encourage you to write down 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It talks about how we are becoming like Christ with ever-increasing glory. Beautiful picture of sanctification. But our word right here is justified, just as if I'd never sinned. That's what we are through the blood of Jesus. Redeemed. We're back to a word that points to ransom. And you remember ransom was, it's paying a debt. It's setting us free from the bondage of sin. The price is paid for our sin. We've been set free from sin. A a ransom is uh, something that's paid to secure freedom. We see that in real life, don't we? In 1963, this is just days after President Kennedy was assassinated. Frank Sinatra, Jr., 19 years old, was kidnapped at gunpoint from his hotel in Lake Tahoe. And the kidnappers made their demands, and ultimately Frank Sinatra Sr. paid a ransom of $240,000 to secure his son's release. Now the good news in the rest of that story is after that ransom was paid, son was released, is that authorities were able to identify and to capture those who were responsible for the kidnapping. The money was gotten back, and those men were convicted for their crimes. But, but the point is, is that ransom, it's a price paid to secure freedom. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He paid a price to secure our freedom. Then this word atonement. This is going to take us back to the Old Testament. If you think about the Day of Atonement, uh, that was one day a year the high priest went into the most holy place. He offered a sacrifice for himself, a sacrifice for the sins of the people. The whole point of the Day of Atonement was to turn away God's wrath by the offering of a gift, the offering of a sacrifice. Atonement, to turn away God's wrath. And so that's what Jesus did because the wages of sin is death. We remember that, Romans 6, 23. But in Jesus we have the gift of of eternal life through the Lord, through Jesus. Jesus, when He came and He died on the cross, He turned away God's wrath for those that would come to Christ that would believe in Him, confess Him as Lord and Savior, that would turn from sin and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Turning away God's wrath. Boy, those are three powerful words, aren't they? Justification, redemption, and then atonement. Jesus paves the way for us to go to heaven. I think that's the big point that we take all three of those words. If it points to one thing, it's that Jesus paves the way. Here's the road that we go to to have a right relationship with God. And Jesus paved the way. Let's continue, verses 25 and 26. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so now we're talking about righteousness, but it's not our righteousness. Man, as I read this passage, you know what I come up with? is that Jesus was the perfect, sinless sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we'll talk about how Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, but was without 
sin. Jesus, the perfect, sinless sacrifice for our sins. So what do we see? When we take this passage, this heart of Scripture, and we put it together, and what we know when the, the passages surrounding that is, you know what we see? We see that Jesus came to earth, He lived among us, and He died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. And on that Sunday morning, the stone had been rolled away, and the tomb was found empty. Through that we see the love of Jesus at the cross. And we see the power of God at the resurrection. The love of Christ at the cross. And the power of God at the resurrection. There are times I'm convinced that we just need to sit back and we just need to stand in awe. We don't need to lose our wonder when we think about the cross and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it's hard today. It's hard today because I think about things in, in, in the world that should, should really leave us in awe and in wonder, but it just doesn't do it quite as much as it would have at one time. Now when we watch the sun set to the west, we watch the moon come up, you know, if, if we were to go outside and just in the middle of the country and do that, it would be just a, a beautiful, awe-inspiring moment. But instead, today, we go inside and we turn on a light switch. There is the, the awe of looking at the river, of looking at water. But you know what we've done now? We have built bridges over those rivers. We've cut trees and we've built cities. All in the name of progress. But, but somehow in the middle of that... It, in fact, you know, even we can pick up a phone and with a series of digits, we can talk to someone on the farthest end of the world now. There's so much of that wonder that we've now, we don't appreciate, I don't think. But what I'm asking us to do is, as we prepare to finish our time together today, is that we just stop. We pause to stand in awe of the love of Christ at the cross and the power of God at the empty tomb. We just need to stand in awe. You see, that's what happened at the resurrection of Jesus when we look in the various gospel accounts. In Matthew chapter 28, talks about the women. They were afraid, yet they were filled with joy. In Mark chapter 16, it says that they were trembling and bewildered. Luke chapter 24 talks about uh, the ones there that saw the risen Lord, that they was full of joy and amazement. And then in John chapter 20, I can't help but think of the words of old doubting Thomas, when he saw the Lord's hands and he saw his side. And Thomas declared, My Lord and my God. Man's greatest problem is sin. But God has an answer. God has always had an answer, and Jesus has always been plan A. Jesus came to earth and lived among us, lived a sinless life among us. But He died as a sacrifice on the cross. It was a ransom to pay the debt for our sin. It was a ransom so that we could be set free from the bondage of sin. He was buried in the tomb. And that Sunday morning, the stone had been rolled away because God had raised Jesus from the dead. And now we have a moment to consider how we'll respond to that. Because that is how all people can be made right with God. It's come to Christ. Believe in Him. Believe that He's the Son of God. That He is to... He, we confess that He would be our Lord. He's our Savior. We repent of our sins. It's just like when we're lost. We turn, we run away from the sin and we run to the Lord. We're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Sins are washed away. We're raised to walk a new life. It may be this morning that you're prepared to make that decision. If you are, I hope you'll reach out to us. Give us a call at 870-836-5038. 
It may be, though, that you've made that decision at some time in the past, but in all fairness, we have, we've gotten so caught up in life, we've gotten so caught up in business, and, and it may be that, that Satan has lured us away from the beauty of the cross, the power of the resurrection. And we need to stop and we need to stand in awe and in wonder of the love of Christ and the power of God. And it may be that today you desire to, to, to be made right with God, to, to recommit your life to Him. Again, if we can help you in any way, whether to come to Christ or to come back to Christ, we'd love to help you any way we can. Give us a call at 870-836-5038.